Welcome, in this video I'm going to be solving Griffith's problem 6.27 as it appears on the third edition of the book. This problem states the following. It says, suppose the Hamiltonian h for a particular quantum system is a function of some parameter lambda. Let en of lambda, the energy, and psi of lambda be the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, right? Nothing new there. The Feynman-Hellman theorem states that the partial derivative of these energy levels with respect to this parameter is equal to the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, of, of the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the parameter. And our first quest, our first task is to prove the Feynman-Hellman theorem. Okay, and then we will apply to the one dimensional harmonic oscillator using the parameter to be omega, the frequency, h bar, and also m, and we will discuss the results. Okay, so let's begin by proving this theorem. Now, the way to go about it is that, well, there are actually several ways to, um, to prove it, but the one that I like is that we are going to take some Hamiltonian that will depend on a parameter. Now, what would that parameter be? Well, as we're going to see in part B, this parameter could be anything. So it could be omega, the, the frequency, it could maybe be the mass of, of the particle that we're dealing with, it could even be h bar. Um, it doesn't really matter, there's many possibilities and each one will yield different results. And when we apply this Hamiltonian to some wave function lambda, then this will of course give us the energy and everything here might depend on the parameter. Okay, so, and this eigenfunction is going to be normalized as it usually is. So let us now begin by remembering that the energy levels, right, they are the expectation value of the Hamiltonian with respect to the eigenfunctions, right? So it's psi lambda sandwiching this Hamiltonian. All right, that's cool. And now let's compare this with what we are looking for. This is quite similar. That's actually why I decided to start out like this. Because now, well, let's take the derivative with respect to lambda, to lambda and, you know, hope for the best. Maybe this is going to help us uh, and it's going to steer us in the right direction. So let's take the derivative with respect to this parameter. Now, the energy, well, the derivative is simply this, right? We just write it that way. And here, remember, this is an integral, so this is basically an integral where we have psi lambda conjugate, h of lambda, psi of lambda, and well, dx. Um, so these are three terms that are multiplying each other and all of them might depend on the parameter. So here we have to apply the product rule, okay? I just wanted to show you that explicitly so that you understand why we have to use the product rule. So first we have this term right here. So we're going to get d psi lambda, d lambda, I guess I should have used a partial sign here um, and everything else stays the same. Then we get plus and now the first part stays the same, but now we get the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian. So we get d h, that depends on lambda, d lambda and of course psi of lambda is still there. And finally we have the derivative of the last term, so we get h of lambda and derivative uh, of psi of lambda with respect to lambda. All right, so what do we have here? Well we can see that we now have the Hamiltonian acting on the wave function which is the energy, all right? So we can just replace this and in fact, we can pull out the energy to outside of our inner product because it's simply a scalar. We can just take it out. It doesn't depend on lambda or, or the, sorry, it doesn't depend on the parameter of the integration. That's why we can pull it out. It does depend on lambda. That's the whole point of this. And we can do the same here. So as we have seen before, the Hamiltonian is Hermitian. So we can put it uh, and let it act on this wave function and we will get once again energy outside. Okay, and now we can see we have these two terms that are multiplied by the energy. So, you know, let, let's factor it. Let's factor it out. So I'm going to take this right here, put it here, and just factor out the energy. So we get this plus this, all of this multiplying here. 
And now notice that what we have there, it's basically just an integral that, uh, sorry, a derivative that follows the product rule. So this looks an awful lot like if we had something like this, right? So the inner product between Psi Lambda and Psi Lambda, and we take the derivative with respect to Lambda that looks a lot like X, all right? So if we had this and we took this derivative, we would get exactly what we have down here. So we can now rewrite this as this total derivative here. Okay, so this would be the d lambda of psi of lambda, psi of lambda. But what is this right here? This is simply, you know, the inner product of the wave function with itself, and that is one, because our wave function is normalized. So we get the derivative of one with respect to a parameter, but one doesn't depend on any parameter. So this is simply going to be zero. So now our expression simplified quite a bit. And in fact, this is precisely the answer that we're looking for. This is the Feynman-Hellman theorem. So this is how we prove it. And now that we have it, let us actually begin to use it because we will see that this is incredibly powerful and it's going to help us perform some nasty calculations in a very, very, very simple manner. All right, so first we have to just get warmed up. So let's apply it to the one dimensional harmonic oscillator and we will use the parameter to be omega, then h bar and then m, you know, just to see what happens. So let us just be reminded that in the case of the one dimensional harmonic oscillator, the energy levels, right, the energy levels are n plus one half times h bar omega. And the Hamiltonian of this system was minus h bar squared over 2m d squared dx squared plus one half m omega squared x squared. All right, this is just what we have used many times before. This is the, harm the Hamiltonian for the one dimensional harmonic oscillator. So now let us begin applying the Feynman-Hellman theorem to this. So step number one, let's take lambda to be omega. Okay, so if we take lambda to be omega, then, well, let's find each one of these terms. So the derivative of the energy levels with respect to lambda, what would that be? Well, lambda in this case is omega. Maybe let's write it out explicitly. So if we derive this, we would get n plus one half times h bar. All right, cool. Now let's go for the Hamiltonian. So the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to this parameter. Now there is no omega in this first part, so that just goes away, but there is here. So we get m omega x squared. Okay, cool. Now let's continue. So what we have to do now is that we have to make this part equal to the expectation value of this. Okay, so let's see. So we get n plus one half times h bar. This was the left hand side. This is equal to m omega x squared and the expectation value of that. Okay, cool. Um, but what can we conclude from this? Well, this right here looks an awful lot like the potential of the one dimensional harmonic oscillator. So the potential for this, for in this case, is one half m omega squared x squared. So if we multiply this equation by two and divide by omega, we would get, uh, so we get multiply by two, divide by omega. We would get exactly what we have in here. So we can actually now replace this by this. So let's do it and we get n plus one half h bar. This is equal to the expectation value of two times the potential divided by omega. But, you know, two and omega are simply constants. We can pull them out of the expectation value. So we get two divided by omega, expectation value of the potential, and now just multiply through by two and omega, and uh, so divide by two, multiply by omega, and we get one half n plus one half h bar omega is the expectation value of the potential. 
So we can see that using the Feynman Hellman theorem, we can find the expectation value of the potential for any value of n, which is pretty cool. Okay, let's now go back and let's do the same, but this time for a different value of lambda or for a different parameter. So let's now, instead of uh, using omega, let us use h bar and see what we can find here. I don't know why I almost wrote squared there. All right, so um, let's now do the de derivative of the energy. So d e n d h bar. So in this case, we would get n plus one half times omega. And by deriving the Hamiltonian, we get, let's see. So now we have no h bars in the potential term, but we do have an h bar in the kinetic term. So we're going to get minus h bar divided by m, the two from the exponential, uh, from the exponent cancels out by the other, with the other two, and then we get d squared dx squared. Now we have to set them to be equal once again. So we get n plus one half times omega, and this has to be equal to the expectation value of what we just found, which was minus, and then we had h bar divided by m d squared dx squared. But this, once again, is quite close to the kinetic term. What was the kinetic term? Well, the kinetic term, it is minus h bar squared divided by 2m and the derivatives. So if we multiply here by 2 and divide by h bar, we would find that we get the same thing that we have inside of the expectation value. So we can now once again replace that and we get n plus 1 half times omega. This is equal to the expectation value of the kinetic energy and times two divided by h bar. And we can now once again multiply through to find that the expectation value for the kinetic energy is going to be uh, one half n plus one over two h bar omega. And that's it, which is actually the same uh, that we had for the potential, which is pretty cool, okay? So that's nice. Now let's see what we can find if we apply the Feynman-Hellman theorem to the case where lambda is m. All right, so let's, maybe I don't have to erase all of this. I'm just gonna do it like this. Okay, so this time we're going to use the mass to be the parameter. Okay, so the energy doesn't depend on the mass, so that's zero, that's pretty easy. But now both of these terms depend on the mass. So in the first part, we get minus h bar squared divided by 2m, and then the derivative of m to the minus one, which is going to bring down a minus sign, which will turn this into a plus, and the m will be now squared. All right, so that's the first part, the x squared. And then we have this part right here while the m will drop out. So we get plus um, omega squared x squared divided by two. And this is with respect to m. Okay, so now we have to set both of these to be equal to each other. So we get that zero has to be equal to uh, h bar squared divided by two m squared d squared dx squared. And then we get plus one half omega squared x squared. I'm gonna go back because my memory is weak. Yes, that's it. All right, cool. Um, and this is of course the expectation value of it. So now this looks an awful lot like the kinetic term, except that this is now divided by m. So this is basically, and it has a, a minus sign. So this is basically minus the kinetic energy divided by, or the kinetic uh, part divided by m. It's going to be the energy once we apply the, um, the expectation value. And this part right here is the potential divided by m. So what we get is zero is going to be equal to the expectation value of the kinetic term divided by m uh, minus this plus the expectation value of the potential divided by m, which in turn gives us that the expectation value of the kinetic energy is the same as for the potential, which is actually what we had already seen uh, before, but you know, this is a nice way to corroborate. 
So we can now see that the Feynman Hellman theorem allows us to find uh, relations with the, uh, of you know some of our constants to the expectation values of the potential and the kinetic energy. And this is going to be incredibly useful when we are dealing with the hydrogen atom, for example, because if you did my previous problem, then you know that finding the expectation value of one over r, one over r squared can be incredibly, incredibly annoying. Um, so we are going to, in the next video, find a way to do it much, much more efficiently. And it's going to be really, really useful in any of the tests you might have. So I will see you in the next video. And if you enjoyed this video and it was useful, please make sure to leave a like, share the video around and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It doesn't cost you anything, but it really helps me out a lot. And also leave a comment, you know, just for the algorithm there. It really helps out. So I'll see you in the next video.